Um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to be talking today about the tailored guidance material, um, also known as the top 20 projects, if um, tailored guidance isn't familiar to you. Oops, wrong way. So the whole aim of the project is to develop tailored guidance material for our most common application types. And how we're aiming to do that is basing our guidance material around what it is that you actually want to do as far as your application. So um, there's a whole lot of information on our, on our website. Um, you're probably all quite familiar with the amount of information that's out there. Um, but some of our usability feedback has shown us that that information is actually quite difficult to navigate. So we know all the information exists, but we really don't know how to pull it together and make it work for, or you don't know how to pull it together to make it work for you so that you can submit an application correctly. So the top 20 project is all about what you want to do. Do you want to register a new product? Do you want to register a generic? Do you want to make a variation to an existing product? So we're aiming to make the application process smoother and simpler and provide you with the information that you need in one place to make sure that your application that you submit is correct the first time. So this tailored guidance material will capture the majority of product applications submitted to the APBMA. So what's, in, so what's uh, within the scope of the project? So as I said, top 20 application types. So when we look at what types of applications that come into the building, as Alan mentioned, minor applications make a really big part of the applications that come in for um, product applications. Um, and so we're focusing our um, initial information on those popular applications or common application types. Um, the project is focusing on product applications. So at the moment, uh, it's not within scope to look at things like permits and active constituents. But certainly if the, product, uh, the project takes off and this is a really good way of providing information to you, then that's something that we consider in the future. What's in is definitely engagement with you guys. So industry engagement is really important. We need to know what you want us to provide for you. Um, and we've been um, conducting some engagement already, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Web content revision. So yes, there's a lot of information out there. Is it correct? Are there things that we can fix um, quickly that might make things a little bit more simpler for you? Uh, it's an also an alternative pathway into an, into an application than the decision tree. So at the moment, the only way to make an application is to answer a series of questions in the online services portal, which then determines what type of application you will submit. And at the end of that process, once you've answered all those questions, it tells you information about it. So we really ask you the information without giving you um, the answers to the question. So sometimes you end up at the end of the decision tree and you're in a completely different spot than where you thought you were going to be. Um, and of course improved website navigation. So pulling things together, bringing that um, wealth of information that already exists and making it accessible and easy to find. So as I mentioned, industry engagement is really important um, and we have um, already had some consultation with the industry in this, in this um, space. The project started in November last year um, and in that time we've had two industry workshops and those workshops have been held with um, five peak industry bodies. During those workshops we have discussed things like what type of applications would be captured in the project. What's the order of priority? So what do you want to see first? What do you want to see a little bit later on? Um, how can we um, work out what type of information should be included in the tailored guidance? We will be holding more of these workshops and there is a drop-in session this afternoon. So if you haven't been involved already or this is a new idea and you weren't aware that this was going on, then feel, feel free to drop in to the drop-in this afternoon um, and we can take your details and make sure that you're included in any, any information that we're circulating. So what we've determined in these first workshops is regardless of the application type, the guidance material needs to include similar things every time. So we want information about, an, uh, about the legislation and a bit of an introduction about what it is that we're um, aiming to um, achieve in this application. And it's all around this I want to. So what is it that you want to do and what information are we going to provide? We need information around time frame and fees. Um, there was a, a big request about providing examples. So give us a scenario where this 
type of application might actually apply so that we can get that vision in our minds and, and understand that that's actually where we want to be. And what is it that we need to provide? So what do, do you as an applicant need to provide the APVMA to address our statutory criteria? So, um, as um, Chris mentioned earlier this morning, um, we have actually delivered two of these prototypes. Um, they went live on the, at the end of August and they're available on the website. We decided, um, in conjunction with the industry, to basically grab what we called low-hanging fruit. So, some simple application types. So, we went with um, varying the sites of product manufacture and varying the pack size for a product. Why we went that path is it allowed us to develop a template and a, um, a platform so that we could work out how the system spoke to each other and how the uh, look and feel of the information might actually be developed. And now that we've got that in place, the <laughs> developing of further content is a lot easier. So that whole um, system interaction was a little bit tricky to start off with, um, but now that we've got that in place, it should be um, a lot smoother going forward. So we're currently developing um, some content around extensions of use, so slightly more complicated variation type applications, looking more at what type of modules need to be provided with those types of applications, um, and looking further into data requirements and things like that, which Robin will talk about um, in a moment. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like, and I'm hoping that this link will work, but I might need Someone show me how do I navigate to this? The mouse, ah, uh, didn't see that. Yep. <laughs> and no. <laughs> Go back. Yeah. So the facial recognition isn't working, just if anyone watched the Apple demo yesterday. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. I'm not touching anything. <laughs> in case you missed anything. <laughs> it's not a URL. Okay, that's right. We can stop there. Yes. <laughs> I'll let you do that. Um, what I'll talk about is while, while Rose having a look at this is so what else are we covering? Um, we're aiming to cover most of the common types of applications. So lots of variations based around what you want to do. So um, adding crops, uh, providing new formulations, those sorts of things. Um, as well as looking at packages of applications like what do I need to provide for a generic application. So th those things that you need to um, provide for a seven is going to be different to a six, to a five, but they're all generic applications. So can we put them all in together and provide Okay, so this is what the content actually looks like. Thank you for your patience there. Um, what the content actually looks like on the web now. So this is live. So there's a bit of an intro page and then there's um, some the two prototypes um, that you can click on. So I'll pick one of these here. And there's also a list, as I was just going through, about what else is coming. So if you're interested in a particular um, uh, <coughs> type of application that you think you could have some input into, then you can have a look at the list and decide that you might like to um, participate in our consultation process. So if we have a look at just one of these, so we navigate from that page to the content page that tells us all about how I might like to vary or how I might um, provide information to vary a pack size. What we're looking at here is not just one type of application, so it's not just an item 12 or an item 14. <laughs> Um, the content is not based around what type of application that you want to um, provide to us. It's based around what you need to provide in order to make a certain application. So in this space, we're looking at notifiable variations, non-technical fixed fee applications and modular applications. So as I said, each, each um, tailored guidance material will, will specifically look at the legislation that's, um, that we need to meet in that space. And then it will provide you with options for pathways. So if I'm a registrant that has an agricultural product and I want to vary a pack size within an approved range, I can select this 
button here and that will drop down all the content and all the information that I actually need to know around what I need to provide for that type of application. Um, and it will provide you with an example. And from this space, we can actually navigate straight to an application. So it will navigate you to the login page of our online services portal. And from there, I don't have a login, so I'm not going to go past this point. But from here, I can log in and that will open that type of application. So in that situation, that was a notifiable variation. That application form will pop up on the screen and you'll be able to populate that information and submit your application from there. So you didn't have to go into the decision tree um, and you didn't have to um, look anywhere other than on that page for the information that you needed to find. So I'll just go into one more type. So I can scroll back up and I can pick a veterinary product. And I'm going to look at varying a pack size for a vet product that's outside an already approved range and I'm providing some data. So the new information populates below. And in this situation we're looking at a modular application. So it'll give me information around what modules I need to provide, what the costs are associated with those modules and the timeframes. It will look at more detail because this is modular <laughs> about what I need to provide. So I need, it will point me to things like um, guides for uh, completing applications, but also things like the chemistry data packages for vet products and specifically what of those data um, guidelines do I need to read in relation to varying attack size. So once I've navigated myself through that information, I can have a look at the example, see if that's what I actually want to do and I can again select my start application and navigate directly to the application form from that point. So that's about it from me. Um, thank you for waiting for the demo to come up. Um, Robin's now going to talk a little bit more about um, her project, which is looking at data guidelines, so the information that sits a, a, a level down from top 20. Okay, so now we're talking about the APVMA data guidelines and the risk assessment manuals. So my name's Robin Shipp. Um, if you hadn't been involved in chemical review you wouldn't have encountered me before but I've been in the area of scientific standards and data guidelines since about the beginning of July and um, I'm hoping to meet and get to know more of you as we go on as we hope to improve our data guidelines reflecting as Alan said we'd like to reduce the number of S159s that we need we want to improve your experience and make it easier and I want to align in with the work that Kelly's doing so that the specific guidance that she has there for you about your application can be reflected in more specific guidance for you for what kind of data you should submit. The thing with data guidelines is someone this morning was saying we like prescription and certainty but we also need to reflect the freedom as um, Dr Phil Reeves referred to the other day that there can be many different ways of solving the problem of how to assess that something is safe and we no longer talk about data requirements, we talk about data guidelines because it reflects that what is required may vary according to the type of product and the type of use you put to it. But on the other hand, we also want to have sufficient guidance that you have a clear idea what you need to do. Interesting balance. Um, before I start, I'm going to say that we, we are encouraging the submission of international assessments where you have the data that's been assessed by another regulator, we'd encourage you to submit it to the APVMA. Don't get excited and ask me questions about that because Jason Lutz will be speaking more on this topic later. But it's definitely something that we're working to have more occurring and we encourage you to do so. The APVMA, we will continue to accept data that is international and are open to greater use where relevant and we encourage you to use the pre-application assistance process to explore that more. In line with government policy, we will only be seeking specific Australian data when needed due to local use patterns or local conditions. Um, but as you may appreciate, for things like your basic toxicology, we don't require that the work be done in Australia. Um, lab rats are lab rats no matter where they live. <laughs> the data can be generated according to international guidelines so you know that the data you're generating will be fit for purpose. And as I've put up there, we have recognised international organisations like the OECD and the Veterinary International Harmonisation Project, or VISH, Food and Agriculture Organisation and the World Health Organisation. 
We also will accept data according to guidelines from other jurisdictions where, again, it is fit to, for purpose and encourage that to be discussed at the PAA as well. In all of this, your feedback is important, which is why I'm here. I want to hear about how the data guidelines work for you and what could be made to improve them. There's a balance here between making what I would think of as some quick wins where things are immediately not clear and we can immediately make them clearer for you. And maybe the bigger picture where working ahead, perhaps the whole thing needs to be rehashed or have a new structure on it or have different pathways in to find what you need. I'm very, I admire very much those little radio buttons that let you click in and click out in Kelly's work to show you what you need. So one example of what I'm looking at is that in May of 2016, as I understand it, we published specific pages on adopted international technical guidance material. And you might not have noticed, because for me, anything immediately just below the big header is almost invisible. Um, and that guidance there is listed by the organisations. And so it's not listed perhaps by the use to which you're putting it or the assessment area. This is in addition to there being links from the different part of the data guidelines to suggested international guidance. And one of the things I'm thinking about is we might like to regroup these and have, say, a US EPA style <coughs> list at the front of things that you can find what you want more easily, or to link in with the outcomes of your tailored guidance so that that pushes you more easily to show you the list of the international guidance that would be suitable for your application. Another option we have immediately below that is we have some pages about the relevant data for module levels. At the moment, a lot of those pages are one big long page. You go there and you scroll down, and that looks like an opportunity to have that you go to that page and you choose something and it directs you to the area that you're interested in. Now, the other half of what I'm here for is the risk assessment manuals. Now, we're describing this, we are reinvigorating the project to get these out there. So starting even in 2012 as part of the better regulation, the APVMA was talking about putting our risk assessment up and out there to make it clear what we do. So we have the overarching risk assessment principles on the website. We want to improve our data guidance. And we wanted to have an outward facing document that describes to you how we use the information you give us to assess those areas that we have to assess regarding safety to people, to animals, the environment, and regarding things like the efficacy and the trade. As these reflect what we do internally, they are consistent with international guidance on how things should be assessed. So you may be aware, say, in the residue space, there's a lot of already present international material. What we'd like to do is draw that together with the Australian regulations and AgVet code to give you an idea of how we meet both, the, we meet the requirements of our legislation, but we follow well-established international guidance on how to do these assessments. These would include, say, toxicology and worker safety, or we can roll that into one health assessment guidance. For example, environment and residues. We're hoping to have the chemistry risk assessment manual out by the end of this year for consultation. Again, your feedback will be sought and appreciated. We need to know if we put this out for consultation, is this what meets your needs? Is it clear and plain? Is it helpful to you? And I can be briefer. So my main message today is we really want to hear from you on these topics. With Kelly, we have the drop-in session today. I understand it is level four in the training room. I went up the lift, I turned right, and I had to turn right again. We also have an email that you can very, you're very welcome to email us at hashprojects at apvma.gov.au. And as you are our main stakeholders and users, what you think and what you need is very important to us. So thank you very much.